goal of my talk today is to tell you more about what we can learn about social learning and traditions from long-term studies of primates. And I will be co-presenting co this with Brendan Barrett, my graduate student. To avoid confusion, let me start by defining what I mean by a tradition. I'm using Dory Fergasi's in my, my definition, which is that a tradition is a behavioral practice that is relatively enduring, that's shared among two or more members of a group, and that depends at least in part on socially aided learning for its generation of new practitioners. So when a researcher begins a study of a wild animal population, it's initially impossible to discern the traditions. In the absence of any information to the contrary, we naturally assume that what we're seeing is species-typical behaviors. Over time, uh, as the observer gains experience, we may notice some individuals practicing behaviors we haven't seen before, or the researcher may expand from one group to multiple groups or sites and notice between group differences. And in those occasions, you may wonder whether what is being seen is, is um, uh, due to ec ecological differences, and if any individual from this species might respond the same way to these particular ecological challenges. Or alternatively, it might be the case that there's been an innovation and that it's spread socially uh, throughout this, this group. So over time, as this research project goes from a cross-sectional status to a longitudinal status, uh, we may develop the capacity to detect social learning mechanisms. So I'll tell you today about some of the methods that have been used to diagnose traditions in wild populations and about some of the interesting findings that have emerged from this research. Field and lab data can mutually inform one another. For example, we know from Marietta Dindo's marvelous work on um, social learning in capuchins that the quality of social relationships impacts the efficacy of social transmission in captive settings. We don't know precisely how relationship quality dynamics alter the spread of traits throughout social networks in natural groupings in which the monkeys choose whom they associate with. This is achievable, but more achievable in the wild. The tight control over experimental design that's achievable in captive situations is useful for some aspects of social learning research. For example, making fine-grained distinctions about which of two subtly different social learning mechanisms are being employed. But to fully understand the evolution of cultural capacities, we need to fully understand how these animals operate in the environments in which they evolved. With recent advances in computation and statistical methods, we can take advantage of the complexity and ecological validity that are characteristic of a long-term observational field study of primates. The richness of these data sets used to seem like a headache, but now they can cons be considered an asset. So here are four questions for which I think long-term field data might be particularly useful. Is social learning an adaptation? What are the population dynamics of social learning in the wild? How do, social, or how do learning strategies vary according to the characteristics of individuals, so things like age, sex, personality? And how do ecological and demographic factors affect learning strategies? Although I'll be talking about many species and different research programs today, most of the really detailed examples I'll be giving come from my research project, the Lomas Barbadel Monkey Project in Costa Rica, where we have over 100,000 hours of observation from 26 and a half years on 530 individual white-faced capuchin monkeys from 10 habituated social groups for which we know genetic relationships. And I'll particularly be talking about a data set on food processing data uh, from 2001 to the present. Now that I've established some of the questions for which field work, and in particular long-term field work, is useful, I'll give you a quick summary of some of the results that have been obtained from field work and the methods used to obtain these results. So what can field data tell us about social learning as an adaptation? Uh, I want to ask what challenges these animals face in the wild and how they use social learning to solve these problems. What kinds of traditions exist in the wild? So what's the culture content of behavioral repertoires? And by that I mean what is the subset of behaviors in the repertoires that owe their existence at least in part to social learning? And how do the types of innovations generated vary according to the types of adaptive challenges faced by different species? The starting point for most investigations of traditions in non-human primates is a collaborative cross-site comparison using the group contrasts method developed by Andy Whiten and his colleagues for the Chimpanzee Culture Project, also known as the regional contrast, process of elimination, or ethnographic method. So in this technique, or this research method, researchers from multiple long-term sites come together and using memory mainly, they, are, they compare the behavioral repertoires at their different sites and they exclude uh, behavior patterns as being traditions if they think that they may owe their existence to genetic or ecological 
reasons rather than to social transmission. So this method helps identify behavior patterns that are likely to be social traditions, focusing our future research in productive areas. It's also useful for making broad strokes cross-species comparisons regarding the culture content in various species behavioral repertoires. In the next slide, I'll show you data from five studies of different primate species in which the researchers have used this method. I'll also include data from Japanese macaques for which we don't have an explicit group contrast method in the sense that they didn't bring in a coordinated way all these researchers together to do that, but we can glean from the literature a nice data set uh, based mainly on observations of innovation and spread through networks and uh, accounts of which sites have and do not have these uh, behaviors. So in this graphic, I've attempted to produce a more even-handed account of the number of traditions in each behavioral domain for each species by using a more comparable lumping versus splitting technique than is present in the, in the um, raw published literature. And so I'll just point out a couple things from the, this complex uh, graphic here. Um, if you look at the, the blue, uh, it's not really working. If you look at the blue uh, areas, the, the foraging, for the species that are extractive foragers in nature, the, the capuchin monkeys, chimpanzees, and to a lesser extent orangutans, um, almost all of the foraging traditions, putative traditions here, are about food processing, whereas in the other species that are not extracted of foragers, they are more about food choice. Another domain I'd like you to look at is the social domain here, the red. So in capuchin, well, in, across the board, the three main categories here are these bond testing rituals, display behaviors, and courtship. And so for these three species, the capuchins, uh, chimpanzees, and spider monkeys, uh, the vast majority, so all of them in capuchins are these, these bond testing rituals, and a few of them in the chimpanzees and spider monkeys are, but you don't see that in any of these other species. This is likely to be because for these three species, uh, alliances are a really important way of obtaining high reproductive success. I won't go into the rest of that right now. Um, the point here is that there may be something about these ecological niches that, which is, is causing greater culture content in certain areas. Now it's important to keep in mind that these putative traditions identified by the co group contrast method are just that putative traditions. We don't know for sure that they're traditions because uh, there isn't any direct uh, evidence for social learning here. It's important to recall that theoretically social learning could be instrumental even in the creation of some species universals or near universals as long as uh, social learning is involved. So for example, attitudes towards dangerous animals. Also social learning may be useful in solving ecological challenges, so excluding behavioral patterns just because uh, they may be explained by uh, ecological differences between sites is probably eliminating from consideration some, some true traditions that are uh, for the purpose of solving some kind of adaptive challenge. So if we want to avoid underestimating the adaptive value of social learning, we need to be careful to include in the traditions repertoires these behavioral innovations that are both stimulated by ecological challenge and supported by social learning. Next question is, what are the population dynamics of social learning in wild populations? So for example, what factors affect propensity to innovate, transmission speed, duration of traditions, and spread of traits between groups? To answer these questions, we need longitudinal data on groups in which we document the spread of traits over time, preferably from the moment of innovation until extinction. And we need information about the characteristics of the individuals and the ecological factors influencing choice of behaviors. We have quite sparse data for answering these questions currently, but I think the situation will improve now that more researchers are working on these, these questions. What factors affect propensity to innovate? So the published literature on innovation in primates anyway relies primarily on plucking anecdotes from the published literature from papers that were not designed to ask questions about innovation. Uh, two general trends have emerged from this literature. One is that younger animals are more prone to innovate, as we saw in Lucy's work today, and subordinates are more prone to innovate. So we don't yet have nice big data sets that were specifically designed to answer these questions. Currently, I am analyzing data from 26 years of observation at Lomas Barbadal in which we've explicitly recorded every new behavior we've seen over all those years, and I don't have that done yet, so I can just give you a couple of sneak previews. We do know a lot about the individual histories and interaction patterns of the practitioners of these traits. And in the absence of deep and thorough history about a population, it's really hard to know 
uh, which behaviors are truly new, which ones are just really rare but present in most or all, maybe even all individuals, and which behaviors were imported by a migrant. So this is information we do have at LOMAS, fortunately. Mainly I'm finding the following types of innovations in this data set. There are a lot of bond testing rituals, and these do spread quickly from one individual to another. There are foraging innovations. Some of them spread, some of them don't. There are a lot of solo play behaviors in young individuals. Those very rarely spread. And then there are a lot of strange personal quirks, which generally do not spread. I'll just give you one example, tail dipping. So, uh, Capuchin monkeys routinely drink water out of tree holes. Normally, they just reach their hand down and get the water out. But if the hole is really deep, they can't always reach. And there are some animals, like this one, who have figured out that their tail is longer than their, hand, their arm, and they can sort of do this little butt waggle. They sort of get their tail way down into the bottom of the, the tree hole and uh, then slurp the water off of the tail tip. So only seven out of 530 monkeys in four out of 10 groups have been seen to do this. Uh, four of these, uh, four, uh, so three of these groups had just one innovator each and no transmission to any other group members, even though they were regularly doing this behavior. And these innovators were two subordinate males who had just become adults and one subordinate young adult female. The fourth group had four tail dippers, all of them subordinate monkeys, and based on their association patterns, it seemed likely that there was one case of social transmission possibly, but no more than that. So this does not transmit easily. How far and how fast can innovation spread via social learning to become traditions? Documentation of spread of naturally occurring innovations um, has been seen in many, many different studies. We do know that the adoption of new food sources can be rapid, particularly during times of food stress. So there are many examples of food choice being transmitted rapidly. Uh, for example, in Japanese macaques, it can take somewhere from hours to days. Acquisition of new foraging skills can be slower depending on the complexity of the task. So for example, uh, Kat Hobater found that moss sponging, using some, some moss as a sponge in chimpanzees at Badongo, uh, spread to eight chimps in six days, which is pretty quick. Something as complex as hammer and anvil use may take months or years to acquire. And I'll give you some examples from Lomas Barbadal social conventions that are uh, pretty well documented. So here you have a game invented by these, these monkeys where they bite a tuft of hair out of the face of the partner and pass it back and forth from mouth to mouth over a period of half hour and then repeat. So here's the time course of that tradition, this hair biting game. Um, this started with this young subordinate male, Guapo, and he transmitted initially in the first year to two juvenile males. In the next couple of years, he transmitted to multiple adult females and also to an additional juvenile male. The females didn't play it very often, though. In 1995 to 98, there were some more demographic change. Some, some females died. And also, these three uh, juvenile males emigrated. But he taught it to one more adult female and two uh, juvenile males. The grade out means that they, they are no longer practicing. In 1999 to 2001, there were some more deaths. This male, K here, returned to the group and started playing it with some more juvenile males. At this point, the innovator became alpha male and lost interest in playing these games. Uh, and so this, this behavior went extinct in this group in 2001, but these four males co-migrated and continued this tradition. So how long can traditions last in the wild? We have four such traditions, these quirky uh, rituals, such as the one I described that we've documented from beginning to end. And so they lasted seven years for hand sniffing, that's sticking your fingers up the partner's nose, uh, eight years for a finger and mouth game, which is similar in structure to the hair passing game. So that was eight years and 10 years, respectively. And there's another game that lasted nine years. A few words about the form of these behaviors. They all involve some risky or uncomfortable bit manipulation of a partner. And the details of what are done is they're idiosyncratic to particular dyads, and then they mutate just slightly as they spread through a social network. So um, it's likely to be the case that this variability, this application of idiosyncratic behaviors to pr particular dyadic rituals may be a feature that makes the ritual a good bond test because of its specificity to particular partners. Archaeological evidence suggests that stone tool traditions in primates last far longer than these bond testing rituals I just described for capuchins. So for example, at the Thai forest, 
chimpanzees apparently have been cracking nuts with stone, hammer, and anvil for 4,300 years. Uh, this is based on radiocarbon dating of tools and uh, the starchy residue on these tools. Similarly, in Brazil, where Dory works, tufted capuchins have been using stone, hammer, and anvil tools to crack nuts or to open cashews and get that uh, toxic exudate off of the outside. And so that's been going on for six to 700 years, about 100 capuchin generations. So probably the reason why stone tool use traditions last a lot longer than these social rituals that I've described is that these are really useful traditions. So uh, there's some point to having fidelity in the form of these traditions and, uh, and uh, preserving this, this efficiency. In contrast, the rituals I was describing, they have pretty arbitrary elements. There's no particular reason why that particular element should endure. Third question, how do learning strategies vary according to the characteristics of individuals? So another, uh, so two, two questions we're going to talk about today. Does sex affect the propensity to copy group mates, and are there age-related changes in reliance on social information? So another way that long-term field sites have made really important contributions is via longitudinal studies that document the acquisition of traits in the context of age-related changes in cognitive abilities, motor skills, strength, and shifts in exposure to conspecific models from which they could learn. So primatologists such as Anne Russen have highlighted the fact that social learning strategies of primates orchestrate these changes in cognitive motor and social development. For example, individuals will benefit most from watching models who are a good match to them in terms of strength and cognitive skills. The kinds of information that individuals need exposure to will change over the course of their lives and will necessitate shifts in both the balance of asocial versus social information gathered and also the kinds of models that they will most benefit from watching. There will be certain phases of the life history when the animals are most capable of benefiting from certain kinds of inputs, and this will vary from species to species. Whereas tightly controlled experiments in the lab can elucidate some aspects of social learning processes better than field conditions can, the inherent complexity of the naturalistic setting can tell us important things that captive experiments, at least as they're typically carried out, do not. In the wild, animals have much more freedom to distribute themselves across the landscape and their active agents in their exploration of the world and in their choice of which group members to associate with and copy. As we watch learners in action, we're quite keenly aware that there's variation in the amount of access each learner has to particular kinds of resources and learning opportunities, and that the time scale over which learning occurs varies a lot from one individual to another. Individuals vary according to their motivations to try new things, their social rank, their age, and the quality of interactions that they have with various models. Thus far, there have been only two longitudinal developmental studies in the wild for primates that focus on social learning of food processing techniques. So one is a study of termite fishing in the Gombe chimps by Lundstorff et al. This was a four-year longitudinal study. Uh, of th they had three males and three females of known ages, and the females termite fished on average 27 months successfully before males did, and the daughter's techniques matched the mother's techniques better than the son's did. They attribute the sex difference to uh, more dedicated visual attention by the females <laughs> to their mothers than the sons had. The sons were mainly playing by the termite rounds. In chimps, as well as in orangutans, the primary exposure that immature animals have is to their mothers. The other longitudinal study in the wild is our study at Lomas Barbadal in Costa Rica of food processing techniques in capuchins. So capuchins, in contrast with chimps, have access to a wide variety of models, so multiple models of each age sex class. This greater social complexity creates many methodological difficulties in isolating the primary source of social influence, but it also offers opportunities to test different sorts of models. So we selected three foods, all popular items, in the capuchin diet, and we followed the monkeys over a period of many years recording the processing techniques used by them, the processing techniques that they observed others use, and who was observing whose techniques. So for this first fruit, Luhea candida, we chose this because it's the natural equivalent of a two-action test. So they will either um, pound the fruits like that or scrub them to get these uh, wind-dispersed seeds out of these cracks. These two techniques are equally efficient, so no reason to think that asocial learning would bias towards one technique or the other. And also, all monkeys know how to pound and how to scrub, so they don't need to learn that from anybody else. So I used this data set to figure out when, developmentally, the monkeys were most affected by social influence and whether social learning is employed in the absence of any advantage to using uh, a social learning. The second fruit, uh, Sterculia apatala, or Panama, is a much different sort of task. This is very difficult. 
Opening these capsules is something I can't do without a machete, and it requires strength, dexterity, and skill. So this is a case in which different techniques may be optimal for monkeys of different ages, sizes, and strengths. So different models may be appropriate for different learners. The third fruit is Sloania terniflora, and the challenge here is to avoid pain. These are covered with nasty, nasty hairs. And uh, the wide variety of techniques used, many of which have apparently pointless stylistic flares, makes the task particularly useful for investigating the role of social transmission of the behaviors within and between groups. So I'm going to talk about the first of these and then pass this off to Brendan, who can explain some modeling techniques he's using on our data that will take full advantage of the glorious messiness and richness of social context in this field data set. So in this Luhaeus set, we, we followed 48 subjects, 21 females, 27 males, over the first five years of their lives and documented how their processing techniques developed and were affected by what they saw. This is the raw data. So each of these graphs is one year of their development. It's basically on the x-axis you've got monkey see, on the y-axis monkey do. So this is the proportion of what they saw others do that was pounding as opposed to scrubbing. Same for the y-axis. So in the first year of life, so each, each data point is one monkey. In the first year of life, all of the infants ate Luhea fruits, but only four of them were precocious enough to actually process it by using these techniques. And you can see that there's pretty close correspondence to, between what they saw and what they did. Year two, everybody was both pounding and scrubbing, and then they also did a bunch of ridiculous stuff, which dropped out of the rep repertoire as soon as they realized it didn't work. So this, again, is a fairly close match, aside from a couple of orphans, between what they saw and what they did. In years three through five, they became more, gradually more polarized into just pounders or just scrubbers, aside from this one individual. So this next graph shows the results of the, the modeling. This graph shows the percent change in practice technique for every unit of change in uh, technique observed. And this is based on the outcome of a Poisson regression model with standard error adjusted for within subject correlation. So this graph combines the influence of the mother, so what they saw the mother do, with the influence of what they saw everyone else do. However, if you split those apart, the curves look basically the same. So what's going on here is these are the different years of life. Uh, the top is females, the bottom is males. So you can see that there was statistically significant social influence on what they did for all years except for year four for males. Females were more influenced by what they saw than the males were. And the primary year of social influence was year two. In contrast to the chimp study, uh, this sex difference is not because of differential exposure to models or differential attention to what they had the opportunity to see. So what I think is going on here is something more like what Franz Deval talks about with his bonding and identification-based uh, learning. Uh, remember, there's no advantage to using any particular technique here. Uh, the only reward is possibly, possibly an intrinsic reward of copying animals that they really feel close to. So the females are the philopatric sex here. They're the ones that are going to stay in this group their entire lives. The males are just gearing up to leave at this point in development. So I, I can't really test this very efficiently, but I suspect that's what's going on, is that females just feel good about pointless copying of what their group mates are doing, and the males don't quite so much. So this type of analysis I used for the Luhea study was sufficient for determining that there was some social influence, for pinpointing the timing of that influence, and for demonstrating a sex difference. But it couldn't tell us anything else very detailed about the type of social learning strategy. In the messy real world, uh, individuals have many choices about how to get their information. They vary with regard to what techniques they initially favor to process food and how much direct feedback they elicit from their environment, for example, about the efficiency of techniques. They also vary regarding how often they seek social information and whom they prefer as models. We wanted an analytic approach that would help us tease apart the types of social learn or learning heuristics and the social biases that individuals use while accounting for the unique um, subsets of demonstrators they observe. We also want to compare the roles of asocial learning and various non-mutually exclusive social learning models while accounting for uneven sampling that is inevitable in observational studies. And I'm going to hand this off to, to Brendan now, who's going to tell you about the other two studies. Now, as Susan was alluding to, one of the challenges of analyzing learning data is linking individual learning strategies to group, to group level dynamics. Um, some recent models have come out that have been published. Uh, we should make some caution about making inferences about what individuals do based off of population dynamic levels alone. For example, with conformity bias learning, multiple different learning strategies can give shape to that sinusoidal curve. 
Um, and especially if individuals are differing on their reliance on social and individual learning, using different social learning strategies or using multiple social learning strategies, it can get really messy. So you need to be able to model what individuals are doing explicitly based off their unique information and then link that to population level dynamics. So the first uh, food processing technique we're gonna talk about is Panama processing. So these are a candidate behavioral tradition used to extract seeds in black over there from these structurally protected fruits. Um, the fruits contain these stinging hairs, a hard outside and these uh, exit gums that come outside of the husk. Uh, generates high levels of close range focused observation. Uh, most highest levels of close range observation only next to wasp nest at Lomas. It's a large proportion of their diet in the dry season. And these processing techniques differ in efficiency and efficacy, as you can kind of see on that guy's face over there. Um, sometimes you can choose to chew a hole, depends on where you want to chew in the hole in the fruit. You can target a weak spot on the fruit, such as the seam where it naturally dehisses, or you might just try to power it open via brute force. And one of the advantages of working at long-term field sites is you get these ideal opportunities for naturalistic experiments that you wouldn't be able to perform otherwise. So, uh, the first study we're going to talk about was a quasi-experiment I did on one group of capuchins called Flakes Group. Um, it was a group that consisted of five knowledgeable adults from different needle groups who differed in the processing techniques they used, and 20 inexperienced adults and juveniles. Um, the reason they had the, and they also differed in techniques, the knowledgeable ones. So this group, Flakes Group, was a fission product of the original stu study group at Lomas. They migrated from this blue patch to that red patch, um, from an intact tropical dry forest to a fragmented patch of riparian corridors, near tropical oak land, and agricultural land. So this kind of provided an ideal opportunity to document how inexperienced individuals acquire and develop a natural behavior in the wild um, when they're exposed to wild multiple knowledgeable tutors with different behaviors. So here's just a quick video to show you guys what the data collection was like. So we collected fruits from outside the territory, exposed them under the cover of a poncho so they wouldn't see us, recorded when and if they handled the fruit, record the processing technique they would use out of seven of them. Here's a bad technique, it's pounding it, never worked. Record audience IDs and proximities. Recorded who they focused directed attention towards or glanced at. So here's an example of an adult male who's coming up in the tree, watching the alpha male chew a hole very intently. And here's the alpha female ignoring her adult son behind her uh, while her infant brother watches. So they're sitting next to each other for about three minutes. She didn't look at him processing the entire time. And the methods we used to analyze this data was a series of experience-weighted attraction models. They were originally developed in the experimental behavioral economics literature to estimate the role of social learning in economic games. Um, one of the advantages of them is you can use directly your theoretical mathematical models of social learning, um, directly a statistical models, so you don't have to worry about the verbal ambiguities that come from what d different people's different definitions of social learning strategies. Um, it also allows you to evaluate multiple candidate learning strategies simultaneously. You can jointly estimate the roles of social learning and individual learning. Um, and individual learning in this case is a reinforcement learning where you get feedback from how successful your technique is. And also in this, the observed social network an individual has is dynamic. It follows the behavior in time and it's unique to each individual. So on short scales, this may not matter as much, but you can imagine over development, especially as social networks expand, who they're biasing their attention towards can drastically uh, differ. To make sure these methods worked, I simulated data and made sure I could recover the true values of the parameters to validate our statistical models um, and fit them using a Hamiltonian MCMC with varying inter intercepts for individuals uh, or groups in a later example, and have a poster later with more mathematical detail and data simulations and model predictions if you want to see that. And this work was also done in collaboration with my uh, dissertation advisor, Richard McElrath. So alongside individual learning, we evaluated the following social learning models, which also all had an individual learning component. So frequency-dependent learning, which included linear copying, conformity, anti-conformity, payoff bias, whether you're copying the behaviors that open the fruit the fastest or have the high, and have the highest probability of success, um, a matrilineal kin bias, copying your mom's technique, rank bias, copying the alpha male and female, age cohort bias, so copying individuals similar to you in age, and age bias, simply copying older individuals, frequency dependent and payoff bias, so those combination of two strategies, and then a global model, where you're seeing if you allow all the six of these to contribute, what's important to predicting behavior. 
And overall, we found that the global model was, that more fa was better favored by WASC values than more than any single learning model. Now, so I'm going to walk you through some of the parameters of the model we can talk about. It's kind of too, much, too, too, too complicated to go into explicit detail about, but we can talk about them later if you want to know. But overall, I'll just talk, walk through some of the parameters. So this is attraction to new experience. Um, overall, capuchins are attracted to the successful techniques and the ones that work better. Um, and o and they're, they're more attracted to the ones they use in the past than the ones that they've used more recently, suggesting they remember what works best for them. And there's also an age signal in this. So we see that older capuchins are more influenced by past experience or by past experience than younger capuchins. So they're less likely to switch behaviors, whereas younger ones will switch between different techniques. If I look at the weight of social information, or weight of social learning relative to individual learning, social information on average explains about 14% of their behavior. And there's also an age signal in this. So we see that older individuals pay less attention to social information than younger individuals. And each of these dots is an individual prediction. Next, if we, next if we start to look at the learning strategies. Um, overall, this model estimates negative frequency dependence which is suggesting that capuchins are biasing their attentions towards rare or novel behaviors. But it's not the only thing that's going on. Um, payoff bias was also exceptionally important. And, so, and if you look at these parameters for these different transmissions biases and the blue bracket, essentially anything that's near zero is not important, and anything that's larger uh, has a larger weight. So based off of the strength of this parameter and the differences between payoffs, um, this suggests that payoff bias contributes probably a little bit more than uh, negative frequency dependence. But also, we get some good evidence for age bias. So they're biasing attentions towards older individuals, which is not surprising because older individuals are often better at this. We also get some evidence for age cohort bias. So they're biasing attention towards individuals of similar age. We get a minor contribution of kin bias, but it's a really uncertain effect, so I don't want to make too many interpretations about it. Um, overall, this is population level predictions. Orient yourself to the daily proportions of observed techniques over 75 experimental days um, on the, on the y-axis, and the experimental days are on the x-axis. So at the population level, if you look at our raw data, the model does a pretty good job of predicting cultural dynamics. So what you see, the most successful technique in red went from being rare in the population to becoming the most common, but it never reached fixation. And importantly, you can also plot unique predictions for each individual, and not all of them reflect what you're seeing at the population level. For example, this individual who was not the innovator, but who first performed this technique, did it pretty quickly and kind of did it almost 100% of the time. Here you can see some naive individuals who eventually acquired it after trying some other things. Um, this is the alpha male who switched behaviors, who was knowledgeable. Another older female who switched behaviors, who was knowledgeable. And here's two adults who closely associated with each other who, you know, they may have explored the new technique but didn't necessarily settle on it. And if you look at some of these juvenile predictions, they never really had a preferred technique, kind of floated around other the various options of processing techniques. Now overall, let me orient you to this guy's graph. You can see that individuals differ in how frequently they perform behaviors. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the 1,500 fruits in the experiments, the order of presentation. The y-axis, we have age, and each row is a unique individual. So overall, you can see that older individuals are more likely, are more likely to acquire individual information than younger individuals, and they're also more likely to act as sources of social information. And if you look at the, I'm sure you guys may have noticed all the red in the top. Um, younger individuals never really got to perform the most efficient technique. I think it's simply because these fruits are pretty big and you had to open your mouth almost the entire width of the fruit. And you may, you may not be large enough or simply may not be strong enough to perform this behavior. And they also failed more often. See if you can see these X's in here. Um, so that's really going to structure the opportunities they have to learn opportunities to update their individual information and going to affect what you see at the population level. So just a quick summary of the findings. Um, we found that no single learning strategy best predicted Panama processing. And I just want to step back real quick. 
it only took about a week or two for this to transmit to most of the behaviors in the population. Going back for a second year, they were largely consistent um, after they picked a, a successful behavior. Um, so overall, the transmission biases we had good support for were payoff bias learning, uh, anti-conformity, age bias learning, and age similarity bias learning. We found that older individuals are less likely to rely on younger or social information than younger individuals. They're more influenced by their past experiences. We also kind of found just predictions that are, or dynamics that arose out of the individual predictions from the models is that social learning might guide the exploration of behavior, but it might be individual reinforcement that's picking what they settle on. So now I'm going to transition into where this is a, we're starting to work on the long-term data set. These kind of early results, but we're trying to tease apart more of the population dynamics of these cultural traditions. So we're going to start off asking about two important things that could affect um, social learning. So thinking about how does group size affect learning? Uh, do larger groups, are they more likely to learn or use different strategies? And other demographically important behaviors like migration. So when individuals migrate to new groups, are they changing their behavior or acting as new sources of behavioral variation? And for this, we're going to look at Solania terniflora. So Solania terniflora is another structurally protected fruit. Makes up about 40% of their diet in the month of April. Um, so capuchins have to remove the irritating hairs, these little purple things, from the outside of the fruit prior to their natural dehissing to you know, outcompete other community members. And the data we're going to talk about today was collected over a period of 10 years um, in 10 groups, about 228 individuals, and almost 18,000 observations. Um, and during this period, we had 65 male migrations in between our various study groups and from also unhabituated groups. And we had seven group fusions during the study, allowing us a group size ranging from five to 39 individuals. So just give you an idea what the behavior looked like. So this is a simple scrubbing technique. We scrub the fruit on the branch. And here's a wipe or palm slap technique where they hold the fruit in one hand and you can kind of see his face scrunching up um, and then hit the hairs off of it. And just to tell you, give you an idea of how terrible this data is collect, it has this purple grain of fiberglass. So it's like throwing insulation in a wood chipper from someone in a tree while trying to collect meticulous details about what's going on up there. So overall, just looking at one learning strategy, we get good support for social learning um, over individual learning. And if you look at weight given the social information, um, each of these black dots is a posterior median for each individual with 100 samples from the posterior are these kind of lighter purple dots. We see that on average, 15.3% of the weight is given to social information, uh, ranging from about 4 to 50% for each individual. Overall, for strength of frequency dependence, uh, our main estimate is that they're maybe slightly, they're slightly conformist. So we get a strength of frequency dependence greater than 1, which indicates random copying. But it does range drastically, so it's suggesting that not all individuals in the population are conformist and other things might be going on that we need to evaluate. If you look at the effects of male migration, so if you see estimates of these parameters after migrating, so after migrating to a new group, uh, male capuchins were less likely to be conformist, and they're also, the social information they observed was less likely to predict their behavior. So this is suggesting that uh, migrant males are not changing their behaviors on average when they get to new groups, but they, but they might be acting as sources of new behavioral variation in the groups that they migrate toward into. If you look at effects of group size on learning, um, we can see that the weight of social information is higher in larger groups, which is consistent from theoretical predictions from a lot of models. And also the strength of frequency dependence is stronger in larger groups, which is also consistent with some theoretical predictions. Just to summarize, we see that Slovenia traditions are socially learned. On average, um, individuals are slightly conformist, but many are not. And that needs to be explained. Uh, males who migrate, on average, are not changing their behavior, but they may act as new sources of behavioral variation. And the weight given to social learning in, in bigger groups is, or is larger in bigger groups, and individuals are more likely, on average, to be conformist in larger groups. So to take back to Susan, bring back to Susan's questions, um, these are kind of future directions we think we need to go in long-term field research for things that aren't answered. So if you think about social traditions as part of the adaptive toolkit for solving adaptive challenges, um, we need to use methods that permit the detection of traditions that can help animals solve ecological challenges. Um, when we talked about the group contrast method earlier on in the talk, that may have not detected some of the behaviors that we have evidence for social learning, for which we have evidence of social learning. 
And we also need more high quality data to address this. We want to think about how does ecological niche or ecological content or context predict the culture content of species behavioral repertoires. We want to think about addressing the population dynamics of social learning in the wild. So we really need a systematic collection of innovation data, and I can imagine innovation something like dispersal, where it's really rare to observe, but it can have tremendous important biological consequences, especially if it's an important adaptive innovation. Um, so we need to have a systematic collection of that data so we can get a better understanding of the evolutionary and ecological importance of it. Other things, do different factors affect the origins versus the maintenance of traditions? Uh, and what are the differences in rate and or probability of transmission across different behavioral domain, domains. Another th thing that's important to think about with innovation is that there's different behaviors that can be innovated in times of in, like free time, like maybe these bond testing rituals, versus innovations that be, can be created in ecological crunch time, and thinking about what predicts or what learning strategies are used in those different contexts. So how do learning strategies vary according to characteristics of individuals, such as age, sex, and personality? So is there an interplay between social structure and these cognitive heuristics or transmission biases that we see individuals using? Um, are individuals using the same uh, stra e learning strategy across, across different contexts? And we also need some more fine quality data on the effects of personality and relationship quality um, to assess how that affects the learning strategies that individuals use. And lastly, are there different selection pressures on social learning across life history stages? It seems like it could be a very important part in understanding uh, cultural evolution, especially in long-lived species like primates and cetaceans. And lastly, how do ecological and demographic factors affect learning strategies? Um, are individuals switching learning strategies in unpredictable or changing environments? And does ecological stress dive in, drive innovation? A lot of models predict that under various you know, circumstances of ecological change, but we really need more empirical understanding of that. So thank you to the many field assistants that have worked at uh, LOMAS, our funding sources, and all the support in Costa Rica that, we, that Susan's had in the past 26 years. And with that, we'll take questions.